This is a really, this is a big experiment. Um, yeah. Take two. Just wait. We're waiting. and who will be talking to us about body wellness and the Karen Tuttle heritage. So um, welcome, Kim, and thank you so much oh, for thank being you. here. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, like I said, this is an experiment. I've never tried to do this except one-on-one -on -one or maybe three-on-one. So I I'm going to be m more formal about it than usual, but still very informal. And please feel free to interrupt and ask questions. What um, the Karen Tuttle heritage for us is a tradition that's based in sensitivity to the body and how the body affects the sound that we make with our instruments. In other words, how do we partner with the body and use it to benefit the sound of the instrument in the concert hall? Um, she developed a system that she called coordination, which consists of um, an action called repro and an action called over the bow. I'm gonna leave that thought and now go through the basis facts that you need in order to understand repro and over the bow. So she always told us if you start with your feet not on the ground, but in the ground, which is also a Tai Chi concept, be rooted, right? You already can affect what you're doing out here because all of us, even cellists, are a little front loaded, right? T we tend to do this. So if you pull back into your heels and feel your weight, you're already having an effect on your sound. So relaxation of the ankles, relaxation of the knees, relaxation of the hip joint, and lining it up so that the knee is slightly over the ball of the foot, the hip is slightly over the heel of the foot. So you're not straight like that, you're not locked. You've got give and balance and you can shift depending on where you wanna go, you can shift the actual weight in your feet and also then keep your sound more unified because you're balancing it out. So working your way up, if we think about the pelvis as being the structure that we sit on, that the whole rest of the body and the instrument sits on, I'm ignoring the cellists for a moment, um, then we can say the ribs have to sit steadily on the pelvis. And the collarbone has to sit steadily on the ribs. And the whole spine, therefore, is one beautiful column which becomes alive because you haven't blocked it anywhere. When you have an alive spinal column, you can also affect your sound because if you're pulling a sound into into your body, which is what I think we should do, and visualize it going down the spinal column into what we call the third leg, which is between your two heels. You are organized in a way that, is, that gives you great stability and great flexibility. So I have to say that almost any virtuoso artist that you watch they're doing this in their own way, maybe not codified like this, the way Karen Tuttle has laid it out for students, but you do see it over and over again in different ways, that the organization of the body helps to make sound. Um, 
my Tai Chi teacher says things in a different way, but it's exactly the same. He says, your joints have to be mobile. You have to rest on the floor. You have to be both reaching downward and reaching upward at the same time with all body parts. And if you can organize that feeling that the joints are working in a free way and not cramped up, his way of putting it is delete all excess tension. It sounds good, hard to do. But one of the exercises that Karen Tuttle had us do, and it's a great one, still, I do it very frequently, is at any given moment in a piece, just stop, freeze, okay. I can tell where am I tense. Can you see it? Anybody? Oh, oops. <laughs> oh, big mistake, sorry everybody. Right here and therefore down the arm. So that's another thing that, is this still working? Yeah. <laughs> tai Chi teacher, he said, tension in your shoulder infects the arm and hand. Tension in the back infects your coordination, right? So how do we work on holding this most improbable position? Cellists are lucky, at least it's centered, right? but they don't get to stand up, so it balances out. How do we get to organize ourselves so that the spine stays flexible and balanced? Her method was to stay in what she called talking posture, so that the head came down like this and you were using the weight of your head. The brain is very heavy, by the way. So nice and heavy, and you don't have to grip if you don't grip here, then you have a chance of not tightening here. If you don't tighten here and you don't turn your head, you have a chance of having relaxed shoulders. So this is, this is basically body mechanics as applied to playing the instrument. So if you all would try flapping your wings like a chicken and see where is the motion. Where do you actually have to move from? See, this is great. I, I see maybe 95% of you not using your shoulder muscles. Only this. But when we tend to go to the C-string, we like to lift. It's not, it's not helpful, not in any way. Think about what the joint can do and how to delete all excess tension. Okay, now we swing this way. I hope you have room. Yeah. And again, are we squeezing these muscles? Most of us don't. We just swing across. So going from the tip to the frog, there's no need to contract. In fact, it's the opposite. If you're doing this, this tends to open. Like a pulley system. If we think like a pulley system, we stay flexible. If we stay flexible, we can move quickly. We're not what in the Tai Chi world is called double-weighted. Double-weighted means you've, you've committed and you can't move. You're stuck, okay? If you contract here, you're stuck. We can teach ourselves to make a bow change, but if you don't contract, if you're using pulley system in, out, there's no problem with changing the bow. It's an exchange instead of a wall that you come up against and say, okay, time to go the other way. Yeah, so that leads us to the idea of repull and over the bow. Now that I've gone through the kind of the basics, right? We have a free spine. We have a free chest and a free back. So we do repull. For numerous reasons, one set of reasons, let's call it the body mechanics grid, okay, is to keep our leverage very good so that we don't have to tense up here. 
So keeping excellent leverage as you go away from your body requires some kind of compensation, right? If you just do this, you end up feeling like, ah, okay? And how can you com compensate? What did I say about moving two directions at once? Move your back down, and then you've pulled with leverage instead of with force. Um, I would love people to try this. I don't, I don't know exactly how to implement it, but also maybe, why don't you come up here? I want you to feel something, okay? Put your hand on my back there. A little lower, yeah. Um, and I don't want to poke you in the eye, so, yeah. <laughs> so this is the repull feeling in the back. Did you feel it? Mm -hmm. It expanded, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That's because I was sending the air down. That takes me to the two-third point. That is where, you can sit down for now. I might need you again. Um, that is where we do what she called over the bow. Over the bow is instead of a lower back release, it's an upper neck release. So the two ends of the spine release to provide leverage. So that would look like this. I'm going to exaggerate the gesture. Now come back. And you want to be over here. Whoops. And put your hand here. So this is what we tend to do if we don't do repull. We tense up in there just to get enough power, right? If I've done my repull, that muscle's down, right? Okay, now I'm gonna go further and bring it into its released position as I do over the ball. Do you feel it? Yeah. yeah. It's a huge difference. It's a huge difference. <laughs> yeah, and that's what creates, um, in her world anyway, and I think for a lot of us, um, the sensation that the bow has no end and that your power can be felt by manipulating the body that way and not by pushing down on the instrument. This works on the cello, thank you. This works on the cello. The repull feeling is this. The same as you do here. I'm exaggerating the gesture. We don't need to move our hands that much. But the feeling is that you, you're sitting at that point. You're not trying to move the bow anymore. You're letting the bow stay where it is. And the hand and the bow are doing opposite things. That's why it's called re-pull. Because you're pulling against the bow. Come here. Maybe somebody else. Come on. <laughs> So I would like you to hold my bow when I get to the one third point. Okay. Not until then. Oh, that. Okay. That feeling. Right. Now you can't help me as much with the neck release, but you can help because I'm gonna um, I'm gonna touch your back. Okay. See what his neck did? It went like that. And that's the gesture that you're going to now do to me, gently, as I go, <laughs> as I go over the bow. I'm going to make my own repull because you can't do both things. That was too low. Okay, too low. Though. Yep. Too low in the, on the back. Yeah. Oh. Okay, that pushed me. That pushed me into opening my neck and chest. I think she came to this, thank you. And we can all try that too. She came to this through a very natural love and it was her love of baseball. When you watch a pitcher or even when you throw, just try to throw, the neck goes back when the arm goes out. Yeah, just, it's body mechanics. So the arm extends out, 
the neck should go back. A little bit. I'm, I'm doing an incredibly exaggerated version of what you end up doing. OK, so this is the body mechanics grid that creates a round sensation from here. <laughs> This is up bow repull. Here. Repull over the bow. Okay. Now you might hear that the result of that is that my sound is leading to the next note. And that's the musical grid that this is good for. They do not always coincide. We always do. Yes. Can I ask a question about that? Yes. As the neck releases, do you lose the weight on the chin rest, or do you still maintain that? Great question. Thank you. If you are using talking posture, then your point of contact is here. The pivot point on the chin rest is there. So you can release because your pivot point is the back of the jaw and still have plenty of contact. If you're chin loaded, you cannot do it. Yeah. So it's a very excellent question. And I think that one of the things that stops people from doing this is they don't like looking straight forward when they play. They'd rather look at the fingerboard. Um, I, I guess it's, um, it's a question of where you want to make your compromises. Yeah. So uh, sometimes I want to look at my fingerboard too, but I'd rather have my best sound, which I get this way. So, you know, you lose a little, you gain a lot, I think. <laughs> Except sometimes I definitely look for pizzicati because I'm not that good at knowing where that is. So I have to look. But that's the only time when I would look. Except I'm looking at him all the time. So it's hard to play concertos and be in this position because Normally, you would want this there, going straight out, and my head would be this way. But I have to see over there, so, and keep my head this way. That's, it's a compromise. On the other hand, it's great if you're playing chamber music, because you can see in all directions easily. Yeah. That's, none of that's that important. Yeah. The point of contact is very important, because that gives you the pivot point that allows the neck to release. She used to say to us, pretend that you're in the most boring class and it's going to go on for another 20 minutes. Ah, oh, that feeling. Ah, oh, if you all do that, you'll feel exactly what it is. Oh, no, she's still talking. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so the musical grid, which doesn't always coincide, with the physical grid, which we're going to do anyway all the time, the physical grid. But the result of the physical grid is that you slow down your bow at the ripple point because there's some resistance. So say I wanted that sound to energize into the E flat. It's very good for that. But what if I were there? and I wanted to release into the E-flat or expand. I have to do over the bow sensation in the bow at the same time that I'm doing physical repo. So I have to take this sound, which is more bow instead of less, and put it in my repo. But I'm still doing the repull because that's what keeps me bodily organized. So I had made the request that some of you might have some passages you might want to tuttleize with me. <laughs> and that would be the best way to continue this discussion is if anybody would pick up their instrument and can be almost any passage.
Yeah. What does the repo look like on the other? Is that in the same way? It looks like I'm doing over the bow because I will always do a neck release because of the leverage question. That's physical. But I will slow down my bow speed. So it sounds like. But I'm still doing my neck release. Yeah. So in the, in the musical sense, we use the terms repo and over the bow, but they are for harmonic tension and harmonic release, which, again, any wonderful artist that you listen to, is, you will see that that's what they're doing. This is just a way to organize it in your minds for students. Yeah. Come to me. <laughs> what would you like to play? Uh, any passage, any phrase. Just um, Bach, cello suite, number three. OK. This is, gets complicated because it's all detaché. That's a different subject. But we can approach that subject now. Yeah. Do you want to go through your checklist? Um, can I touch you? Yeah, please. Release your knees. <laughs> OK, and feel like your knees are uh, right over the balls of your feet. Actually, you should take those shoes off. They're not terrible because they're flat, but they're squeezing your toes. Yeah. OK. And now feel that your hip bone is sitting right aligned with your heel. And the whole pelvic circle is supporting the rib circle. So I can't see if that's working or not, but I'm going to believe. OK? <laughs> yeah. And then these, the shoulder blades will go down. Yeah. There you go. Now you're ready to try it. <laughs> Bend your knees. So I'm going to make some corrections. You're just going to be my guinea pig, OK? Now, to me, you looked like you were very front loaded mm -hmm. this way, OK? Actually leaning forward with your neck mm -hmm. and the shoulder. And those things don't help your sound. Mm -hmm. I think the sound has um, a lack of core and focus mm -hmm. for that reason. Mm -hmm. So when you put the bow on the string, actually, give me your bow. Put your arm on the string. Yeah, it's already better. You feel that? Yeah. yeah. OK, now you want to be a little higher in your elbow, but that doesn't mean you have to lift anything else, mm. right? Mm. So do you think you can handle the bow the same way? Yeah. Do it again from, from ground zero. Yeah. Boom. Yes. That would make a sound. Mm. Yeah. So don't try to play yet. Just Go to the string and sit there. Uh huh. That's, we don't need a low elbow. We need a low uh, shoulder blade. So it's not about doing this. It's about relaxing the whole upper torso. Yeah. Good. I would like to know what that sounds like. Just open string. Huh. Yeah. See, that's that's a, a good, deep, round, focused sound. Let's see if you can play the first note the same way. So maybe I'm going to take this away for a second, and you're going to pretend you're at the tip. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, you're a little bit front loaded. Yeah. yeah there you go. Yeah. <laughs> we d we all do that. Yeah. Okay. There. So reset. Good. Good. Now go to the A string. That's easier. Good. Now play the first phrase. Wow. You were great. You played almost eight notes without getting front loaded. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, that's a lot. Oh, you're under 
observation and you're doing it for the first time. So I'm going to give you a reminder by putting my hand here and you keep your shoulder blades back. Yeah. Right, so I'm going to remind everyone of the chicken exercise. Because she was fine on the A string. As soon as we went to the D string and further up, oh, oh, guys, started lifting. Oh. Yeah, you don't need to, right? Do the chicken flap. Yeah, so you'll notice when this goes up, this goes down. Yeah. You feel it? Yeah. That's what you want to do when you're playing. It's always, there's always that pulley system, one way or the other. In the horizontal plane, there's the pulley system. You're pulling from the tip to the frog, you're moving in, something has to move out. You're going from the A string low position to the high position, something has to go down, right? Okay. Good, good. <laughs> there you go. Uh, you just front loaded yourself. Okay, because I'm going to keep touching you, okay? Yeah. Is there... <laughs> Play that long C again. You hear it? Yeah. Okay, it's extreme. The, the gesture is extreme right now, but you will practice that way, mm -hmm. and then it becomes built in, and it can be subtle. Mm -hmm. Try it again. Just the low C. Yeah, see how it connects and opens the sound. Yeah. Yeah, see how it rings. Yeah. yeah, okay. Those are all good things. Now, the, the over the bow is easier for you to implement than repull, and there's a reason for that. We haven't really talked about the hands. The hand on the bow has to be flexible to do repull. So it feels very much like Pretend you're a baby holding somebody's finger, like that, mm. right? You've all had a baby hold your finger, right? They have unbelievable power. Yeah. You can't get out, <laughs> and they don't have any muscle development yet. Mm. Where does that power come from? That's just natural grip, right? And have you ever seen a baby do this? <laughs> <laughs> And we don't either. If you pick up a water bottle, for example, anybody have one? Yeah. Look what I did. OK, you grab it. Square. Square to the thing you're picking up. Now, you hold this for me, OK? And pass it by me. Would I ever do this? <laughs> Again, it's not a natural way to hold the object. And when you do this, you do that thing that we were talking about of being double-weighted or committed to one point and being unable to change. So if you're this way, now pull the, pull the top of the bottle. Pull the other way. Anyway, see? That's, that's the way your hand should feel on the bow. So, yeah? not. Limp spaghetti. I am not talking about overcooked spaghetti. Not this. Not at all. It has tone. But you can, you're flexing elastically with and against the motion. So if you can put your hand like that. OK, let go. Let go. Yeah. So now you're soft. Before you were, OK? So you got to be soft. And then, yeah. 
Now you have a chance at flexing. You feel it? Mm, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna take you to the repo point, and now try to go down bow. Yes, that's it, that's the feeling. recorrect this. I can't fix everything at once and nor would it be correct for me to do so because you have a good technique for who you are and what you're doing. But you have to be squared off to the stick to do repull. So we're going to rethink that again. Okay. Now go to the, this point. Now keep going. See how you have to be that way? Yeah. You can't just stick to it like this. Yeah. Got it? Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Release? Release? Yeah. Yeah, oh, not all the way. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was good. But I just meant release so that you could feel the tug of war. <laughs> Somebody else should try this. Very, very good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, quick question from Heather on Facebook, since we're talking about that right there. Do you have any tips or ideas on how to help the bowing arm with rotator cuff impingement and the mobility of the right shoulder in general? And if this is related to the setup angle of the viola on the left shoulder? Yes and yes. <laughs> Uh, should I talk into that? Oh, or? No, no. No? Okay. Yeah. Rotator cuff basically comes about for us when we've spent too much time pronating or rotating towards ourselves, so we're closing the joint. You spend too much time with a closed joint here, and you will impinge on the nerves and maybe hurt the muscles. If, if Heather, did you say? Yeah. If Heather could think about using a backwards motion, an opening motion in the shoulder, so that the action is moving towards the back, not towards the front, she will stop impinging on that joint, and eventually it should help. I mean, I don't know how badly she's injured. So the first thing is rest and try not to move too much until it's not inflamed. And then move with the action of the joint this way. It's the same with the elbow joint, not this way, but this way. So you're opening this joint too. And if you open both those joints, you, you have allowed yourself many more possible motions. Now, the question of whether or not this has something to do with it, that brings up the subject of using um, a shoulder rest and who ought to and who might be better off without it. Um, the one thing that a shoulder rest does that's good is it makes this more height. So you tend not to do this as much. However, it also does one bad thing, which is it raises the instrument above your shoulder, which means that all of this is up here because that's where the action is, right here. You've moved everything higher, so the shoulder has to go up. Now, that would be better if she's square-shouldered to try being on a level so the two shoulders are level. If she's very sloping, then that space has to be filled up. And you can fill it up with something like this in the right spot without actually lifting where this is. OK? So this is, again, this is looking at the, the geometry of the body and figuring out what is going to work best. Yeah? Yeah. I, 
I don't know what that is. Oh. oh. Can I try it? Well, look at this. Okay? And, and where I have to go. And now, sorry, look at this and where I don't have to go. I don't have to lift this anymore. So that thing is not great. <laughs> For that purpose, it's not. But if, can I see your shoulders? You could probably get away with using just pad, but if you feel more comfortable with a shoulder rest, try to take one that doesn't lift the string bow contact point up above where it would have to be. Yeah? So I guess you would want to fill out not this part, but this part of the instrument, because that keeps this lower. Okay? As soon as you lift this up, you're causing problems. Yeah. That's all true for the rot rotator cuff person, too. Yeah. Yeah. You want to play something? Do we have time? Yeah, OK. I'll just play one phrase from the first movement of the Symphony of Concert Time. Great. also uh, musically something that involves inner rhythm. So in this case, your ripple point is one, two, three, and your over the bow point is three, da, 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 da. So we want to use the sound of ripple to create transfer points within the music. So we have a... Instead of... Just a little... Release. Let go. That was repull. I would take one bow here, but if you if you don't, you want to do a, a bow pull. But I think uh, is probably better. Okay. Yeah. Should I try it a little slower? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. yeah. more singing and more flexibility built into it, we can improve it even more by really thinking we are going to compress. Ripple is a kind of vertical compression. Um, I'm going to ask you to do this. Stay where you are. Would you be willing, would you feel safe and would you be willing mm -hmm. to do this and play a note and before the second note get up on the chair? Fully. Fully up. Yes. You think you're comfortable? <laughs> okay. Good. So start like this? Yeah. That chair. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is an... This is another way of explaining the, the physical and musical concept of repull. This is resistance, right? So let's say you're going to resist between A natural and B flat. 
So you want the sound that a singer makes of We all recognize that, right? But what's going on between the notes? That's what happens when you stand up. Go for it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was, honestly, that was too easy for you. Okay. That was too easy for you. I didn't really hear it. Let me try. Yeah. Feel the effort. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, like that. And this is, you're done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if we think of that, this is a way of describing physically the stepping up is the same thing that we're describing when we're tug of war with our own bow here. So taking it back to Nice and slow. It's okay. <laughs> you felt that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, you did a great repo on the first bow. Da -da -da -da. They forgot about this one. Okay, try it again. So the groups of 16th notes, you were trying to organize them in repul too, and that's correct. Repul. Release. Yeah, you're doing it very well. It would be better for you, um, easier to feel if your thumb were participating in the grab the bottle feeling. Yeah. So your thumb likes to do this. Mm. Push up. If it's pushed up, you can't really feel elastic release. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So like that. Just pretend, pretend that your hand shape is being formed by a ball. Yeah and that you're hanging on the back side of the hand, the fourth finger side, which is what opens up all of this, right? Now draw the bow to the third point. Pull, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's too much, but it's that feeling. And it's that feeling of having resistance at that point. Yeah, try it again. you to bend your knees a little bit because your ankles are tight mm. yeah so this stuff doesn't actually come through the viola unless the body is released yeah it's amplified by the body yeah there you go yeah yeah you 
you felt it, right? Yeah. yeah. I know. I know. It's pretty amazing that the knees are like buying a new viola. If you re <laughs> release your knees, you don't need a new viola. <laughs> okay, and, and the same release here will give you yet a better viola at the tip. Take your time. There you go, yeah. So there's a reason she calls it over the bow. It's because the apex of your release comes after the bow change. So it's not on the bow change, it's after. That's what gives you the release and the round feeling of going through, yeah. Clear? Great? Thank you. Okay, welcome. Talking about release in the right arm, um, so this book says, I have terrible tension in the index finger of my left hand that causes tendonitis in the finger when I play a viola. Any advice that would help with that? Left hand index finger. Well, I mean, without seeing it, I'm, I'm a bit at a loss, but my guess is t thumb tension. And it, it, maybe she should try opening her thumb. And a general good rule, just like this is a good rule with the bottle, the same thing holds true for how you use your left hand. If she would just make a fist for me, a normal fist, away from the fingerboard, and see where does her wrist want to go. In fact, you can all try it. Most of us have some cock in the wrist and are not like this. So I don't know why we all play like this. Because we naturally open and close this way. Most people do. So, and there I see we were talking about your thumb. This thumb too. Keep it open. Yeah. Yeah. So if you do that, and then you pretend that that gesture is just being Stop by the fingerboard, but if the fingerboard were to magically dissolve, your hand would still go back to that position. She can try that. Yeah. Uh. Is Bartok okay? Absolutely. It's a great passage for this. Good thinking. That's good. I can work with that. <laughs> okay, so, huh? I missed something. What did I miss? Ah, ah, okay, good. Verstanden, <laughs> okay. <laughs> If we consider that those first two intervals are not two steps, but one. not right? Then where would Ripple go? Exactly, right between those two notes. Yeah, so we would prepare That's like standing up on the chair. I'm not going to. <laughs> so I exaggerated. But a little bit of that feeling of uh, And then connect. In this case, the over the bow is only to help you connect. Now this timpani. So I'm going to conduct the timpani with my repo. Repo. Okay. Yeah. So it it closes the circle. It keeps well. It keeps the figure eight or the circle moving. 
yeah? And you get to express your intervals and the um, melodic and harmonic tension of those intervals, okay? So just try the first two pitches. <laughs> no timpani. <laughs> you as a as a um, exercise to just stay on the A natural until you really feel you've produced the F. No, no, no. Maybe there. You have to want the sound itself has to want to go from one note to the next. Yes. Yes. And now you have to release. Yes. See, that sings. That's beautiful. You could have done a little more repo, I think. Yeah, yeah. That's a little late. Okay. Yeah. Now. Okay, could you sing it for me? But don't worry about the instrument. No. Da oh, bad voice. <laughs> <laughs> Not expressive voice. Who has an expressive voice? Can you, yeah, yeah. Can you just sing that? Yeah. Okay, do you hear what's happening between the first two notes? Do it again. Yeah, okay that where his diaphragm tightens and everything goes deeper, boy, that's repull. That's exactly repull. So listen to that and then try it again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Good, good. Yeah, now let's, if, if we went further. This is a good one to try it on because it's all four beats. One, two, three, four. So repulls right in the middle there. Exactly. You, do you feel the difference? Yeah. yeah. I find I have more bow. You have more bow because you're molding the bow. You're not just moving horizontally. You're moving in a vertical plane as well. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. OK, good. Um, questions? No, OK. <laughs> Thank you, all my guinea pigs. <laughs> so I think time is up. If anybody had questions, we could just take a few, maybe. Right. There's a couple on Facebook. Is that OK? Yeah, sure. OK. OK, so um, Alice asks, as someone who uses a shoulder pad instead of a shoulder rest, mm -hmm. um, how do you not squeeze with the left hand when shifting or doing vibrato? That's a complicated one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Go back to what we were talking about, uh, that the joints have to stay um, uncompromised and not contracted. So if I think about what does it mean to shift, what am I actually moving? I'm not moving my shoulder. I'm moving my elbow. So I can swing my shoulder joint and only move my elbow in and out. This way or this way. So I don't know if that's going to help her, but it's nothing to do with the shoulder, actually. Shifting has nothing to do with the shoulder and everything to do with this. Shoulder stays exactly where it is. If you've got a good position, that's the other thing. You want to be able, not cellists, but you want to be able to walk. You want to be in walking position. 
instrument should be stable enough that you can move it around, but you have complete mobility. So if I can do this, I can certainly shift, <laughs> right? And the other one was about vibrato. Well, that's, that's if she puts her hand in this position, the loose fist, and then turns it over and says, wave goodbye. Right? Just wave goodbye. Now turn it back over and do the opposite gesture. Is there any thumb tension? You don't need thumb tension, because the whole action is either if you have an arm vibrato from here or from here if you have a wrist vibrato. Doesn't involve the thumb at all. So we can think about this gesture as step one. No, this one, step one. Step two. Step three is hold your own thumb and still try to vibrate. If you can't do that, then you've got tension in the thumb muscle, which needs to be released. Because the hand, the palm of the hand, wants to separate from the thumb when you vibrate. I think that's true for, do you have an arm throttle? Must do arm, arm or, 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 you don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's the same thing though, that the thumb and the, I don't do arm vibrato, so I'm just checking. I do it. Yeah. So the thumb and the arm have to separate in either case. Yeah, 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 okay. Then that's good advice. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I guess we're, we're done here? Yeah, okay. Thank you. from Karen Tuttle, but, but she's the inspiration for all of this. Yeah.